Hello there. Welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And so much love to each and every one of you. How are you doing? I do hope you're doing incredibly well. I'm doing fabulous, thank you very much. And I hope you're keeping yourself lovely and cosy and warm in this cold weather and drinking lots of hot drinks to keep yourself energised. So let's get started with tonight's lovely story. But before we get started, don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell and the thumbs up. Let's get started now with tonight's story. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, Our small, quaint American town was nestled in the heart of a beguiling valley that overlooked exquisite mountainous views that dappled the distant horizon in a hazy ethereal kaleidoscope of pale blues, pinks and purples that looked like an artist's loving, talented hands had skilfully, painstakingly painted them in on the landscape with the subtle hues of watercolours. The individualistic, unorthodox houses in our rural neighbourhood were built relatively close to each other, but with sufficient enough gaps between the houses to give every resident some breathing space, so that you couldn't hear your neighbour engage in a barney with their other half, which was a monumental relief as far as I was concerned. When I was seven years old, both my parents had lived in an apartment in town, we lived next door to a couple that was constantly bickering, like two sniping belligerent dogs, and then making up all the time. The walls in the apartment were so fine and so paper-thin that we could hear everything that was going on. Nothing was left to the imagination. It would seem the intricacy of the couple's relationship, from their volatile explosive outbreaks to their intimate moments, when they were copulating, while their noisy cumbersome bedpost would constantly bump against my wall as I was the one that lived in the bedroom next to theirs. So let's just say I heard some things that taught me a thing or two about adult relationships that I would rather not have been privy to at that impressionable young age. When I say the houses were individualistic, they were exactly that. Idiosyncratic might be a better word to actually use. Some houses on the street dated back to Victorian times. Others had been built in the 50s, the 60s, 70s and 80s while some were more recent modern renovations. So I like to compare the houses with different free-spirited, quirky characters, for they had distinctive personalities of their own. Some were old-fashioned, others simplistic, bohemian, ornate or even modern, innovative and contemporary. So it was indeed an eclectic, vibrant mix of varied tastes and styles. The house that I was privileged to live in with my parents was built in the 50s, so the ivory cream exterior was simplistic, symmetrical, but exceedingly pretty in a girl-next-door kind of way. Our front yard was pristinely mown, decorated with a cobbled path that led directly to the dark blue front door. The ribbon of road that ran down our street had recently been repaved with asphalt, so riding down the road on our bicycles was an absolute joy. The road was so delightfully smooth. The pavements on either side of the road were lined with tall, imposing oak trees that were very dignified, mature and lofty, and their branches moulded into each other, creating a vast, awe-inspiring canopy above our heads, which meant our street was heavily shaded. The common land and front yard space in the anterior of our long line of homes was very generous. People during the summer and spring would have the most phenomenal eye-catching flowery displays of terracotta pots, hanging baskets and flower beds filled with colourful blooms. The backyards on our side of the street were quite sizeable, but they were fenced in as the private land that lay beyond belonged to a farmer, where a heavily wooded area sprawled out into meadows where cows grazed happily all day long. Living in a rural neighbourhood, where we were on first-name terms with each other, was an expedient privilege. We had the sort of magnanimous neighbours that you could borrow sugar from should you run out of the essential ingredient when in the throes of baking a cake or something. That happened quite a lot with my mother. She so often overlooked the most basic ingredients in her shopping list, possibly because she never wrote a list in the first place, which highly infuriated my punctilious father. I was an only child, which I thought was a distinct disadvantage at the time, envying anyone who had a brother and sister, thinking that they had a better deal than I did. I falsely perceived that I was most unfortunate, but all these years later I'm not so sure that I was, 
as being an only child meant I got my parents' consummate attention, so invariably their congruent devoted love wasn't divided between several siblings, nor could my parents have any favourites. They were saddled with me, whether they liked it or not. So I was the one that was invariably spoilt and loved, even when I wasn't that easy to love. For believe me, I had my moments when I was not the most agreeable. I was fortunate to live next door to a young boy, who was the same age as I was, who had a baby brother of whom he had nothing in common with, due to the vast eleven-year age gap between the two of them. His name was Jack Clarkson. I liked him an awful lot. It never bothered him that I was a girl, which was a big plus for me. We lived in the kind of unassailable, secure neighbourhood, where people would go to bed at night, not bothering to lock their doors, as there was no crime in our area. But that soon was to change, when our street was hit with a mysterious spate of enigmatic, fuliginous robberies that happened on our side of the street. The first person to be robbed in our street was old Miss Felicity Kendall, who lived in the house several doors down from us. At twelve years old, I thought she was ancient. She was an elegant, enervated old woman, who was so petite, enfeebled and frail. I would often think that if the weather became tempestuous, she would be knocked over and blown away, like a languid feather by the blustery, unrestrained wind. People in our town always gravitated towards my mother, when they were upset about something. So I learnt soon exactly what happened to Miss Kendall first-hand, when the robbers broke into her house. I would surreptitiously park myself on my mother's large Persian rug, that was thrown across the parquet floor of our living room, next to the sofa, while my mother did her level best to reassure her distressed guest. She was a natural counsellor. She was empathetic, mellow, and kind by nature. On this occasion Miss Kendall's face was as white as a sheet, her blue eyes so very large with fear they almost looked too big for her face. She stood in the doorway, trembling. My mother quickly led her into our living room, while she went to the kitchen to make some tea, returning with a large silver tray, a bottle of brandy, and a large plate of chocolate biscuits. My mother always believed brandy and chocolate could help in every emergency situation. My mother poured Miss Kendall a piping hot cup of tea, in her best Royal Dalton teacups, and poured a tot of brandy in the cup, which she quickly handed to the old lady. Miss Kendall took it from her, but her hand was shaking so much that the cup rattled precariously. For a moment I was certain she was going to drop it, as she was wobbling so much. But after a couple of sips, the brandy seemed to settle the frazzled woman's nerves. My mother was absolutely right. It was amazingly effective stuff. "'Please tell me what on earth is wrong?' she asked Miss Kendall. "'I was robbed last night,' she said, the words coming out of her mouth in a quiet, faint whisper. Almost as if she said them too loud, they'd come back to bite her like a boomerang. "'Oh, no,' said my mother, gasping, clasping her hand over her mouth in astonishment. "'What on earth happened?' "'I thought I heard a noise. I'm a light sleeper, so I'm easily roused. Actually, I thought it was Percival coming through the cat flap into the kitchen. Sometimes it's a tight squeeze for him. That cat is desperately overweight. Of course, it's all my fault. I feed him way too much.' I give in to his every whim. He's a very demanding cat. He's also a lot less agile than other cats, given his great rounded girth. So I thought it was him making this rather unfortunate thumping, scratching noise. I thought maybe he was now so fat that his mighty girth had got stuck and trapped in the cat flap. But then I was almost certain I'd heard footsteps. I glanced briefly at my bedside clock. It must have been about two o'clock in the morning. I surreptitiously climbed out of bed, tiptoeing cautiously onto the carpeted landing. I glanced down the long staircase. That was when I saw two figures, dressed in black, wearing balaclavas on their faces. One of those faces looked directly up at me, and for a moment we locked eyes. Felicity suddenly grabbed my mother's hands, squeezing them tightly to give her some emotional support. I just remember those big blue eyes staring up at me. Oh, I was so scared. I immediately dashed into my bedroom, locking the door behind me. I was shaking so much, I thought I was going to have a heart attack. I heard a th crashing sound, and the men just fled. Finally, I managed to call the police, but the only thing I could tell them about the two mysterious offenders was that they were wearing black, and one of them had piercing blue eyes, which doesn't exactly give them much to go on, does it? Miss Kendall took another few mouthfuls of tea 
She grabbed a chocolate biscuit, which she nibbled gracefully, like a tiny mouse. So did they take anything, my mother asked. They did as it happens. They stole some pieces of antique silver from my dining room cabinet display. Some of those pieces are worth a fair bit. They also stole my treasured antique clock that is displayed on the mantel. That's worth a bob or two. So whoever they are, they clearly know a thing or two about antiques. I was going to leave those pieces to my children in my will. So I am bitterly disappointed by the theft, for even the contents insurance cannot compensate for some of those rare irreplaceable finds. That is terrible, Felicity, said my mother. I wish I knew what to say to you, but I don't. There are no words. It's horrifying. How do you think the robbers got into your house? Miss Kendall flushed pink. Through the kitchen door, she exclaimed. I always forget to lock it, but I never worried about that. I've never known our neighbourhood to be unsafe. Well, that's hardly your fault, came my mother's reassuring voice. You weren't to know someone would barge through your door like that. It's very distressing. What did the police say? Well, they said that these days robbers are much more brazen than they used to be, with the increase in drug consumption and addicts. And sometimes it's not just men that do the robbery. There are women as well, although some of them turn to prostitution. But they take risks that they wouldn't normally take to support their addiction. But they did say this is one of the first burglaries in our small town for many years. At that, a little tear spilled down Miss Kendall's cheek, like a long raindrop on a glass pane. Now there, there, said my mother. Please don't get upset, Felicity. The good news is they absconded when they saw you. They didn't hang around, nor did they hurt you. So that's a great big plus. Of course, when news of Miss Kendall's burglary got around our small town, people's heckles rose, while family households worried about their own safety. Some people even installed alarm systems, and a couple of people put up fake cameras, which my father thought was absolutely ridiculous, as he said, you can't fool anyone with a fake camera. People always know when they're fake. I couldn't help thinking my father was possibly right, but we were one of those families that installed an alarm system. At first, having an alarm seemed like a novelty. I thought it was exciting having the state-of-the-art panel in our entrance hall, but I was soon to realise it was the most annoying accessory or gadget in our home. I cannot tell you the number of times something would set it off, possibly a fly flying past trying to make its hasty escape. It had the capacity to scare the whole family half to death. As the motion activator was stimulated, then the alarm would invariably go off, so a simple little fly would have caused our entire family a restless night's sleep. So I grew to despise that alarm system, which had the most annoying, loud, blaring noise that was more scary than anything else, if I'm being brutally honest. For a while, there were no more robberies in our small town. Even our family slackened in their vigilance, prematurely relaxing in the surveillance. Soon we overlooked activating the alarm system, until in a matter of weeks there were three more robberies in our street in the very same week, which made us all feel the more vulnerable as why were the burglars picking on our street, for goodness sake, abandoning and forsaking other neighbourhoods? It felt as if our street was being clandestinely watched, our coming and goings monitored and recorded. The first robbery happened to the Andrews family, who'd gone away for the weekend. They returned home to find all their prized stuff in their house had been evacuated, from valuable priceless antiques, artworks on the walls, some select pieces of furniture, and even their flat-screen television. The police had warned them that lightning can indeed strike in the same place twice, and it probably would. It was more than a little likely. The robbers would indeed return when they replaced the goods with their household insurance policies, and they were absolutely right about that, for the Andrews were robbed three more times, if I'm not mistaken. The other family to be robbed was the Sinclair household, who were about five doors down from us. They were absolutely shocked to have slept through the entire robbery, not hearing a single thing. But the glass panel in their downstairs sliding door had been perfectly cut with an expert precision. The robbers had gained entry that way, and had seized some quality stuff, and a contemporary piece of artwork that had cost the family an arm and a leg. So these burglars, whoever they were, appeared to be remarkably astute. They knew exactly what they were looking for. They succeeded in locking up the two golden retrievers in the sizable downstairs toilet, throwing them a whole bag of bones to keep them occupied. Mrs. Sinclair was sure that if there was a next time, her golden retrievers would almost welcome the robbers back into her home with open arms, hoping for some more bones to chew on. 
I regret to say that although feathers were definitely ruffled in our community, I certainly believe my family conjectured, as is often the case with human nature, that we would never be robbed. The fake security our alarm system provided for us left us falsely assured that we wouldn't be burgled. Isn't that so typical? I think we had the intrinsic warped belief that bad things happen to someone else and not to us, which is both irrational, nonsensical and completely bizarre. I mean, how ridiculous is that? It's someone else that has a car accident, someone else who gets a rare deadly disease, someone else who gets run over by a bus. I think it may be the way we are naturally hardwired to absolve ourselves from being tormented by the worries and afflictions that the likelihood of those things happening to us would bring about. Nobody wants to believe it would happen to them, but to us it most certainly did happen. I remember it was a Friday night. It was about 10 to 12 when I thought I heard a crashing sound. Much like our neighbour Felicity Kendall, we also owned a cat called Gurlaine. Well, actually, she was mine. She was a grey cat with white socks on her paws. So agile, pretty and slight. But she was constantly on the prowl for mice in the early hours of the morning. She was a formidable hunter. I often woke up the following day to find carcasses of dead mice littering the underside of my bed that looked like a war zone as my cat had spared no mercy to any of the victims of her deadly assault. I believe she brought those mice to me as little gifts, as Gurlaine was obviously my cat. I gave her the name after my mother's skincare products when I read the name on the bottles. I thought it was so pretty, so my cat is named after an illustrious, very posh Parisian cosmetic house. Anyway, after the crazy crashing sound, I perceived it must be Gurlaine, up to her old mischief again. Indeed, so did my parents reach those same assumptions, as my mother said to my dad, Oh, that damn cat! The next thing the alarm was activated. It began roaring through the house. The deafening noise almost made me jump out of my skin. I could hear my father in the landing saying, Calm down, everyone. I'm sure it's a false alarm. Gurlaine has knocked something over. Activated the sensor. I'm sure of it. I groaned, pulling the duvet over my head. I must have fallen right back to sleep. I woke up later to go and get some milk from the refrigerator as I was suddenly gripped by an inexplicable thirst. I was walking down the staircase only to find my father lying on the floor in a crumpled heap at the bottom of the stairs. At first I was so shocked, I thought he was dead. I remember just standing there on the steps, unable to move a muscle, frozen in terror. Then I let out a shrill ear-piercing scream that had my mother dashing out of her bedroom as fast as she could, darting down the staircase. She also began to scream when she saw my dad lying there at the bottom of the stairs. At first we both assumed my dad was dead, but we soon quickly realised he had a nasty gash to the head, and he'd been knocked unconscious, but he was breathing, so he was rushed to hospital and was let out later that day with a slight concussion. He was told he need only return if he experienced bouts of dizziness, thumping headaches and blurred vision. It transpired that he went downstairs to deactivate the alarm system and as he was returning up the steps back to bed, something or someone thumped him hard on the back of the head with a crowbar or something exactly like that, he couldn't be sure. He said he could feel himself falling, then everything went terribly black and he remembers nothing after that. We were to discover that quite a few of my parents' antique collectibles, silverware and Royal Dalton pieces had been seized. Of course the police came to visit our family, asking us all kinds of curious questions that none of us could answer. I mean, we could hardly give any account of the robbers when we hadn't seen or rarely heard much. I could tell by the policeman's sober expression that they were getting more than a little flustered by the progressive ongoing burglaries in our street. After my father's thump to the head, people became worried that these burglars were turning dangerously physical. Sooner or later, someone could end up dead. And then they did. Days later, it would seem that Felicity Kendall was found lying deceased at the bottom of the stairs with a revolver in her hands. Obstensively, she must have approached the robbers with this revolver. What happened next is unlikely to fully ever be known. So now the robbers, whoever they were, were wanted for murder, although the coroner concluded that Felicity had fallen down the stairs, but there was the distinct possibility that she may well have been pushed, which left many in our neighbourhood more than a little nervous. We adopted Percival, her overweight cat, 
and pretty soon Percival and Gurlaine were inseparable. Percival began to lose weight effortlessly, as Gurlaine introduced the cat to the wonders of hunting, so now the dead carcasses of mice increased under my bed exponentially. Me and my best friend Jack Clarkson talked a lot about the robberies on our street. We regularly rode our bicycles down the smooth asphalt road. We saw a white van parked in our street, with two furtive-looking characters sitting in the front seats, watching the comings and goings on our street, and eating burgers. But whenever we looked their way, they would immediately rev up their engines and drive away as fast as they possibly could, behaving in such a suspicious way that their absurd, dubious behaviour certainly sharpened our attention. Jack and I emphatically believed they were behind the robberies in our street, as they would accelerate down the road so fast to get away from us, so unfortunately we never got a really good hard look at them. Jack believed that the robbers were young men, supporting a drug habit. Of course I wasn't sure about that, but one thing we both noticed is that all the robberies were occurring along one side of the road that faced the woodgrove on the private land that was owned by the farmer. Jack fancied himself as a sleuth. He modelled himself after some of those Nancy Drew stories. He told me when he was grown up he was going to run his own private detective agency, where he was going to catch cheating spouses, fraudsters and robbers. I thought it was a swell idea. I told him that I also fancied being a private detective. Just because we are young doesn't mean we can't start sleuthing now, Jack had told me. We can show the police exactly how it's done. We decided to call ourselves the Jackson too. I began to take down notes. To my amazement, I was to discover that the large wire fence that pinned in all the backyards on our street had a huge open gash in our fence that was so large and superbly obscured by the hedgerow that was growing rambunctiously in the front of the fence. It had also been put back so meticulously that unless you looked very closely, you wouldn't have known the opening was there. I'm sure that even my parents had no clue about it. Jack and I assumed that this was the way the burglars were entering the property, so it was firmly decided that I would keep watch on that fence from the upstairs window of my bedroom that directly overlooked the view of the backyard. It was decided that I would phone Jack on the cell phone if I saw the robbers so that we could follow them together, surreptitiously find out exactly who they were, and then inform the police. A crazy plan, I know, but at that age the idea of catching the robbers seemed very appealing to the both of us and as far as our safety was concerned, we didn't give that minor consideration even a fleeting thought. In truth, I guess we wanted to be the heroes in our small town. Let me assure you, just because you're twelve years old, doesn't mean you don't have ambitions beyond your years. On the next few nights, I would set the alarm on my cell phone for every half hour, so I would wake up and keep a vigil on the fence. One night I saw the silhouettes of two men creeping through my backyard, and discreetly tiptoeing past my house onto the street. The effortless way they were moving gave me the distinct impression that these men were young, possibly still teenagers or in their early twenties. I knew at once they had to be the robbers that had been burglaring our street. By the looks of things they were in the middle of a robbery right now, at this exact moment, but I couldn't be sure of this fact. But let's just say whatever they were doing, they were clearly up to no good. I quickly threw on a pair of jeans, a sweatshirt and a pair of sneakers, tiptoeing along the landing. My sneakers were making such a terrible squeaking sound. I was forced to stop every second for fear of being heard by my parents. It didn't help that both the cats were on the hunt again, and on seeing me were rubbing their silken bodies against my legs, purring so profusely that I was scared they would waken the entire household. I need to go, I whispered to them. I tiptoed down the ribbon of carpet of our sweeping staircase towards the hall, where the light of the alarm panel was still flickering. I disabled the five-digit alarm system, which was easy to remember, as it was the date and year of my mother's birthday. When the alarm registered the disarmed signal, I stealthily tiptoed towards the kitchen, exiting the house through the kitchen door, turning the key in the lock very discreetly. Then cautiously I crept out of the house, ever grateful that both my parents could sleep through almost anything, so were unlikely to wake up in a hurry, unless both the cats managed to rouse them with their loud purring. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest as I quickly phoned my friend Jack, pressing the numbers down on my cell phone as fast as I could. Thankfully he answered with a rather groggy, hello, which suggested I'd woken him up out of a deep sleep. I'm outside, I told him, here in my backyard. I've just seen the robbers going through the fence into the street. 
Hurry! Be quick! I could hear the excited tone in his voice. I'll be there in a moment, he assured me, and he was true to his words. I almost wondered if he'd been going to bed every night in his jeans and sweatshirt in eager anticipation, because surely no one could move as fast as he had done. I met Jack behind the yard shed. His eyes were animated, gleaming brightly like twinkling stars. He was carrying a torch in his hands. I feel it in my gut, he told me. We're going to find out who these robbers are. We made our way gingerly through the fence that was left wide open. Obviously it was currently in use by the robbers. I was amazed to see a collection of stolen stuff, covered by a long black plastic torp, directly outside the fence, obviously waiting collection. I realised in horror that these young men were clearly caught up in the middle of a robbery, but I couldn't fathom whose house they'd broken into, as I didn't recognise the items that had been stolen. I knew we were now on privately owned land, belonging to the farmer, and the only route we could take at this point was through the woodgrove that was made up of mixed trees from evergreens to dogwoods, oaks and red alders. Let's go and hide in the woods, Jack suggested, so that we can discreetly follow the men when they take one of the hiking trails. I did wonder if the robbers purposely selected a night with a full moon, as although it was dark there was just enough moonlight dancing through the infirmament, casting its ethereal shadows through the canopy of the trees, which meant that one could see one's way relatively clearly. Having said that, it didn't make things any the less scary, as walking through the woods at night is not an adventure for the faint-hearted. It requires nerves of steel, real guts. For the forest exuded what I can only describe as a menacing, uncongenial ambience that caused my heckles to rise. The tall statuesque trees clustered together in convivial groups that appeared so congenial during the day, but seemed to morph into unsavoury, monstrous beings at night as the soft breeze that blew against their boughs made them appear to have hundreds of octopus-like tentacles that could reach out and grab you at any given unfortuitous moment. It was like I could see things that weren't really there in my mind's eye, as if it was playing tricks on me, creating all kinds of vain imaginings, like I had done when I was a little girl. It didn't help that the shadows of the moonlight caressed the contours of certain trees in a soft light, which meant the forest felt as if it was alive, with hundreds of eyes just watching us everywhere. The smell of the forest was pleasant, but the familiar night sounds I was so well acquainted with that most often offered me a measure of reassurance appeared absent this night. That was when I heard the faint mumblings of two young men trudging through the forest, I could hear the distinct sounds of tree bark and leaves being crunched under hard rubber soles from walking boots. Jack and I quickly took cover behind a large oak tree, our ears cocked up like a dog's, as we listened and waited. I could hear male laughter. Two men were standing in the forest, phoning someone. It went well, bro. The family disabled their alarm system. Didn't reactivate it at all. Usual story. Possibly thought it was the wind. Well, yes, it is rather breezy tonight. And that can activate the alarm. We got through a window. No, they never heard a single thing. Slept through it all. I think we got some good stuff. Looks like it might be worth something. Well, yes, we have left the stuff under the black torp as usual. So if you could come and pick it up in the ATV, that would be absolutely brill. Speak to you later, bro. The young man looked up at his friend. So there you go. We're done for the night. He took out a packet of cigarettes from his top pocket and lit the tip, offering his friend one. The men stood there smoking for a while. I could smell the stench of cigarettes invade the air with a pronounced, distinct smell that had undertones that made me secretly suspect it wasn't just cigarettes that the men were smoking. "'What's that?' said one of the men suddenly. "'Did you hear it?' "'Hear what?' said his friend. "'Don't scare the bloody bejesus out of me. What did you hear?' "'That's the whole point,' said his friend, taking another puff of his cigarette." "'Have you noticed how bloody quiet it is in the woods, bro? "'It's never been like this before. "'Something doesn't feel right. "'I kind of feel as if we're not alone. "'As if we're being watched. "'Is this one of your sordid jokes, bro? "'Cause if it is, I ain't laughing. "'When you nearly dropped that plate on the floor this evening, "'I thought we were going to wake the entire household. "'Did you not notice they had a hamster on a wheel downstairs in the living room? "'They're probably used to him making such a racket during the night.' Those things can be a hell of a noisy. I'm telling you, bro, my sister had one once. We could never get a night's sleep. Bloody nuisance he was. All of a sudden I could hear the strange thumping sound in the Sylvan. Whatever it was, it appeared to be coming towards us. 
It was like this thunderous sound was bolting along at breakneck speed, like a herd of trumpeting elephants. Surely an ATV doesn't make a noise like that, I thought, determined to keep as still as I possibly could. While Jack appeared to be physically shaking, he was overcome by terror, perceiving that whatever was coming towards us, it was anything but good. I could hear the two men saying, What the hell is that? And then we heard these heavy feet getting closer, closer and closer. And you just knew without seeing anything at this stage that something ponderously big was making its approach. That was when I noticed the branch of a tree swaying up and down. Then we saw him. He was easily eight foot tall, easily as wide and big. He could easily have been seven hundred pounds or possibly more. But I've never been good at estimating size. But make no mistake about it, this thing was monstrously huge. Its silhouette was very human, but it towered like a solid, burly tree trunk. It was covered in long, flowing hair that seemed an inky black colour. It had overlong arms and a pyramid-shaped head, low slung on the shoulders, with a face that was so remarkably human that I was completely caught off guard. The two men who'd been smoking openly gawked at the creature, as if they were so stunned they were almost incapacitated by shock. It was then I realised what this creature actually was. It was a Bigfoot. It was definitely male, for the energy he exuded was powerful, lofty, commanding. The creature was furious. His anger was frenzied, as if the sight of the two men displeased him greatly. He began to roar at them. Let's just say that sound made our annoying obtrusive home alarm system seem like a pretty tone in a musical box. The roar had the capacity to just go right through you like a sharp knife. One of the men said to his friend, Run! He's going to kill us! The creature grabbed one man, throwing him on the ground so hard that the man let out an audible groan. Then he grabbed the other man with another arm and also threw him onto the forest floor. That man also let out a painful, anguished cry. But I didn't get the impression the Bigfoot had killed the men. I think he had incapacitated them. Things were about to get more shocking than I'd anticipated, as the Bigfoot ran directly over to the trunk where me and Jack were hiding, as if he'd known we were there all along. I was so petrified. I thought the creature was going to attack us. I could feel I'd wet myself as the warm trickles of my own urine dribbled down my legs. I looked at the Bigfoot with terrified eyes that were as round as saucers. Jack seemed equally as discomposed, as he was physically shaking like a blamage jelly. Because let's not kid, this huge creature was literally the most intimidating figure I'd ever seen. To my amazement, the Bigfoot, whom had been so aggressive towards the two men, was like a lovable teddy bear towards us. As his demeanour changed quite profoundly, he exuded a protective, brotherly, nurturing energy, staring at us with warm, congenial eyes that seemed so incredibly kind and were terribly beautiful. It was then that I realised the Bigfoot had indisposed or immobilised the men briefly like a taser gun, if you like, on our behalfs, as he seemed very determined to lead us to safety, assuming responsibility for us like a wizened elder. He gestured for us to follow him, leading us directly back to the gate from whence we had initially come. So we scrambled through the fence. Once he was perfectly satisfied we were indeed safe, he nodded at us, gliding away. For a moment Jack and I stared at each other in awe, so delighted that the Bigfoot had been so nice towards us, and moved by how protective he had been. I thought he was going to hurt us, said Jack, but tonight I feel we encountered an angel. He was incredibly kind. As you can imagine, I rushed home to tell my parents that there were two men in the woodgrove seemingly unconscious. I told them the story, agreeing with Jack to keep our encounter with the Bigfoot secret, as Jack emphatically believed some people, if they learnt about it, might willfully hurt him, and we couldn't allow that to happen. He was our friend as far as we were concerned. You always protect your friends. I'm very glad to inform you, as we had initially suspected, the men were not dead, but badly concussed and bruised. They were arrested by the police and confessed to the spate of burglaries in our street, but they never breathed a word about their Bigfoot encounter to the police, probably due to fear of ridicule. They claimed they'd taken a beating from a black bear, which did puzzle the doctors who said that it was an unusual bear attack if that was the case. The farmer who owned the private land, I gather, had three children all of his own, but his wife had fostered a difficult young teenager who was addicted to drugs. She was a kind woman who wanted to help a young man whose life was wrought with challenges.
The trouble was her foster child was an obnoxious young boy, addicted to drugs. He was the one who was going to collect the goods in the ATV. I think he was about 18 years old. To support his habit, he had collaborated with two other young men in their early twenties who were equally dependent on drugs. One whose father was an antiques dealer, so he knew about valuable collectibles and where to sell them to fetch a tidy sum. So those young men were very selective and particular about what they chose to steal. They only stole from properties on our side of the street, due to the easy accessibility from our fence to the backyard. But the two men who engaged in the robberies had definitely been watching our street from a white van, the very van that Jack and I identified as suspicious. When asked if they'd killed the old lady, Felicity Kendall, they said that the nervous woman had pointed a revolver at them from the top of the staircase and was so frightened and overwrought, she lost her footing and went flying down the steps. They were shocked to learn the old lady had actually died. As you can imagine, in our neighbourhood, we were considered heroes for catching the thieves in a manner of speaking. And believe it or not, today Jack really does run a very successful detective agency. So there you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Once again, I apologise for my little cold and my nasal drip. So until next time, goodbye and good night.